Hi friends, and welcome to Art Lab. I'm your host, Kendall Hilligus. Have you ever struggled with feeling like you don't know what to do with your creative work? Like you spend all of this time making it, and then once it's done, you don't know what it's for or where to put it or who to give it to. Maybe it even hits earlier on in the creative process for you. Maybe you can't even get past the idea phase because every idea you think of seems pointless. Why make it if it's not going anywhere? This experience can be super common with newer artists trying to develop a creative practice or with more established artists trying to break into a particular field. And the way it often presents is this internal sense that if only somebody would commission them, if only a client would hire them, or if only they could land a gallery show or a book deal, if only there was some place to put the work when it was done, then they'd be able to make it. And this isn't just the desire for a creative brief for you know, a client that will come and tell them what to make or you know, will come up with the ideas for them, though of course it can impact that too. Uh, I think in many cases, the artist has no trouble generating ideas. They can even be kind of an idea factory, but there's almost this sense of nihilism because they know that even if they follow through on one of those ideas, the work that they make won't go anywhere or be used for anything. Another way it can come up is with folks who are just graduating from some sort of creative arts program. And if you were privileged enough to attend one of these, you will know that after graduation, there can be a fall off where even just the most prolific and skilled students sometimes stop creating entirely because they're no longer in an environment where there's a clear built in endpoint for their work. Making work without an endpoint requires a really high degree of internal clarity and motivation. Another way that this can manifest is in the creative person who maybe has a very solid practice. Maybe they're even prolific in the amount of work that they produce, but they're sitting on a pile of it, a pile of this work that is you know, 90% done and never finished. I honestly don't know how common this second scenario is. I feel like in terms of the folks who reach out to me, the folks who I end up talking with the most, uh, they usually fit more in the first couple of scenarios I described where, you know, it's a new graduate or a beginning artist or someone trying to break into a particular field who is struggling with that sense of not having an endpoint for their work and feels like they're kind of waiting on somebody else to give them one. That presentation seems a lot more common to me, at least in the folks who reach out to me online. But in my own life, in terms of creative people who I I actually know or who knew growing up, I know a number of folks who would really fall into this other bucket. They're really gifted and skilled creatives and go through phases of prolific work making, but just end up sitting on this huge stash of creative work that is either fully complete but not shared or nearly complete because the creator feels like it's not quite ready yet. What all of these folks, what all these struggles have in common is what the writers David Bales and Ted Orland call losing the destination of the work. In their book, Art and Fear, which is just a classic, it's been around, oh boy, how old is it? I mean, I think it's like 20 years old, um, at least. I, I will have to check the publication date and put it in the notes, but regardless, it will be linked. Uh, anyway, in Art and Fear, um, David and Ted describe this phenomenon of creative graduates losing the destination of their work and how this ends up propelling a lot of folks into MFA programs just so that they can continue to have a destination for their work. And I'm not meant I'm not trying to throw shade on any MFA programs or folks who've gone into those, uh, but that's just kind of a phenomenon that they describe in their book. But I think it's present for folks who haven't gone to art school too, and even for folks who create prolifically but never finish anything. So why does this matter? Why does losing the destination, having a loss of destination impact creative work? First, creative work is made for something. If we don't know where it's going, if we don't know why we're making it, it can be difficult to find our bearings when, they're in, when we're in the midst of the creative process or even to know if a creative work is complete. I think a lot of us can have this assumption that we can just have an idea or a concept and that that's the goal and that once the concept is complete, we'll be able to know and check it off our list. But a really good target, a really clear creative goal often needs more than just a concept. It also needs a destination, the place where it will be shared or used or at the very least recognized by you, the creator, as being complete. And of course, we do have to recognize that creative work made solely for the creator, solely for the process process itself is absolutely valid. I have made tons of this kind of work myself, but even in that scenario, having some clear way to mark the completion of a work is still important. Even if you're making it only for yourself, you still need to know when it's done. And beyond that, at a certain point, many creative people, even those who may begin with a private creative practice, will eventually want to share their work with someone else too in some way, because creativity is a form of communication. Think about it like this. 
Imagine you are an illustrator and you illustrate a bouquet of daisies and there's like a million different things that this bouquet of daisies illustration could be used for. There's a million different places where it could go and the final stretch over that finish line, the last phase of the creative process really can't happen unless you know what the destination of that piece is. If it's for anything beyond your own personal creative practice, it makes a difference whether those daisies are going to be used on a birthday card for your grandmother or whether they're going to be a spot illustration in a gardening magazine. And having that clarity, knowing where the destination is from the beginning can really help sharpen how you go about that creative process. The second related reason having a destination is important is that the work needs to be finished. This doesn't mean that every painting, every song, every idea has to be fully completed. I'm not saying that, but looking at your creative practice as a whole, the overall pattern of how you ideate and make your work, if completion is not in that picture, if there is no completion phase, it can be tricky. We have to be able to finish things in order to evaluate and grow and build on them. Getting to a place, getting to a point where your involvement in that piece is done, where it's no longer an open tab in your brain, a work in progress, can be really helpful because it allows you to step back and reflect on what you've learned. And of course, you can and do learn from the actual process itself from making the work. And my personal bias is probably that most of the learning happens in that space. But finishing, even if all that means is saying to yourself, this piece is done, this work is done, and that you're not going to take it any further opens up space for a different kind of learning where you can take a different posture, you can reflect, you can be objective, and you can observe yourself and your own relationship to the work. But stepping into that posture, admitting that something is finished, deciding it's finished can feel really uncomfortable because maybe it's not living up to your hopes. Maybe it's imperfect. It's a lot more comfortable to just keep things in that nearly complete zone where they can never disappoint you or worse, anyone else, and they still retain a little bit of that you know, kind of magical possibility of perfection that you have in the original idea, which is all the more reason to try to finish things or at least to say that they're finished so that you can get used to this feeling, which is uncomfortable and start to desensitize yourself to it. The third reason that creative work needs a destination is because art is communication and when it is shared, magical things can happen. Now, the longer that I make creative work, the more deeply convinced I become that the work I make is not just about me. The work itself has its own life. It has hundreds of lives or maybe even thousands depending on the piece because it has a different life, a different meaning with each and every person who interacts with it besides me. You know, there are a lot of things that are mysterious to me about the creative process itself, about how our brains work and how and why we feel inspiration or not. But overall, I tend to be somebody who is pretty practical about that sort of thing. I just really believe in demystifying it and showing up day after day, looking at what works and what doesn't and taking some of that you know, more mystical element out of it. But when it comes to actually sharing the work and the way that the work can change during that part of the process, during the sharing, and the way it can mean different things to different people without any plan or intention from me, even if it's something as simple and straightforward as an illustration of a bouquet of daisies, that really still seems kind of magical to me. And if you're not sharing your creative work, and, and I don't even necessarily mean on social media or at some big broad scale, but if there isn't a point when you allow another human to develop their own connection to the thing that you made, there is a whole element of the work that never gets to emerge. The relationships that other people will have with it, the stories and meanings that other folks will bring that you did not expect or intend. Those things can't happen if the work isn't ever shared. So yes, it is perfectly fine and valid and good to have a lifelong creative practice where you are the only one with a relationship to your work and your own growth and enjoyment in the process is the only destination. I am, I'm not trying to diminish that or say that it's you know, the wrong way to go about it. I'm just offering the perspective that if you and your work never leave that private place where it's just the two of you, if you never allow anybody else to connect with it, it can leave a lot on the table. And to get a little more specific and concrete here, knowing not just that the work will be shared, but the way that it will be shared, again, whether it's going to be on that birthday card to your grandma or whether it's going to be a social media post, can also then impact how you make it. So there's all these other inputs and people 
pieces of feedback and, and information that, that can feed into the actual process itself. Okay, so I think we have established that uh, creative work benefits from having a destination, an endpoint, because it's made for something, for someone. And when it is shared, it can grow and develop even more layers of meaning and impact that in turn feed back into the process of making that work itself. So what can you do if you are somebody who is struggling with not having a destination for your work? Maybe you're a new graduate of art school who has just lost their destination when they graduated, or you're somebody who's a beginner in their creative field and you never had a clear destination for your work to begin with, or you're that third type of person that we described who has this massive cache of partially completed artwork that for one reason or another, they have never shared or finished. What can we do about this dynamic? How can we face this challenge of not having a destination for the work? Today, we're going to unpack four ways that you can make your own destination. And I'm not talking about how to submit a gallery proposal or how to cold pitch a book agent. Those are fine things to do, but they're not really in your control beyond submitting the pitch to begin with. So instead, we're going to talk about four ways that you can plan the destination right along with the idea, right along with the concept when you're starting your creative work and build that organically into your practice. Okay, let's get into it. All right, so the first approach is pretty basic and it's to share the work online. This is probably one of the most common pieces of advice for emerging creatives, usually because it's a good way to be discovered or to build connection with potential clients or peers. And those are true and valid reasons for doing this, for, for putting your work online. But the reason I'm suggesting it here is a lot simpler. Sharing your work online is a super accessible and concrete destination that is in your control that you can access right now. Even if you don't want to make creative work for a living, even if you don't want to be discovered or connect with clients, sharing your work online can serve as a really clear marker of the work being complete, of the work being finished. When you hit publish, even if that piece isn't perfect, you're saying that it's done. It's like a rite of passage almost, and walking through it gives you a little bit of distance from the work, opening up that space that we talked about earlier, where you can learn by kind of looking back and reflecting. And of course, putting it online does also make it possible for other people to connect with it, but that's not the main reason I mention it here. When it comes to online sharing, a lot of us naturally have this sense that the reason to do it, the reason to post is to be discovered or to get interaction and engagement and likes. And while this has its place and getting likes does give that nice dopamine hit, that's not the baseline purpose here. This is sharing online just to have a destination. And with this as a goal, with the destination, destination as your goal, it doesn't really matter whether there's a big audience or not. This is just to have a place to put the work, to send a signal to your own brain that that work is done. And even so, it, it can still be really scary to do this if you haven't shared creative work in this way before. In fact, I was talking with a friend recently who was sharing some about how they had a lot of pieces of creative work that they had made that were mostly done and that they felt okay about them and some of them they even felt proud of, but that they still felt really anxious about sharing them because they weren't quite sure whether they were really ready or not. And I definitely relate to this. And I would guess that many of us do because putting your work out there, especially if you have never done it before, is just objectively nerve wracking, regardless of the audience size. There's no way around that. And part of what adds to that anxiety is that when you do post or share creative work online, there are all these other questions that you have to answer and choices that you have to make that have nothing to do with creating the work itself. I remember back when I was first putting stuff out there on Tumblr and a, a little bit on Instagram too, but mostly on Tumblr, I had so much anxiety, not just about sharing the work, but about how to present it. What should I title things? What should I put in the caption? Can I just leave the caption blank? What hashtags should I use? And my worst hangup of all was the bio. And for the longest time, I think I just had maker of things in all of my bios because I felt like you know a phony calling myself an artist or illustrator. Overall, there are just so many questions related to presentation and how other people read you and receive your work when you're sharing work online. And those questions are compounded even more if you're trying to do this sharing under your own name. Because when you do that, when you share work under your own name, you know that if you post that song you wrote, your cousin will see it and she'll tell your Aunt Patricia and Aunt Patricia will maybe leave an embarrassing comment or tell your mom about it. And then your mom will want to talk about it at your sister's birthday dinner. And that can be a really uncomfortable feeling. Anticipating that chain of events can be really uncomfortable. I could tell you that you should just push through that feeling and just do it anyway 
way because it's okay and who cares what those people think? And that is true. And if you are all right doing that, if you have not been hung up on this for a really long time and you just needed somebody to say, it really doesn't matter what label you put in your Instagram bio. And yes, people will misunderstand you sometimes and it might be embarrassing, but also who cares? If all you needed was somebody to tell you that, then consider this me telling you that and yeah, go ahead, go for it. But if that doesn't help you, if that permission doesn't help you, if you already know all of that and you're still hung up about sharing your work online, sharing work on the internet, because you don't want your Aunt Patricia to see your post, then just make an anonymous account. Get a new email. Don't add your phone number. Don't give whatever app you use permission to access your contacts. Just do whatever you can to give yourself a cozy little bubble of anonymity where it feels safe to experiment. And you can always go public and claim that work as your own uh, later on whenever you're ready. And I think that that is one of the truly good things about the internet where you can have both the magic of sharing things and putting things out there and saying this is done. And also a little bit of anonymity if sharing your work with IRL people feels too uncomfortable. So whatever platform works with your media, with whatever type of creative work you make, consider finding some place where you can share it online, either anonymously or not. Another way, the second way to make your own destination is to share your creative work with another person or maybe a specific small group of people. They don't necessarily need to be doing the same type of creative work as you. Like if you're a musician, it doesn't have to be a group with other musicians. It can just be other creative folks who are making their work and putting it out there in some way. That's really the only requirement. Adding in some kind of a structure or rhythm to the sharing, whether it's a monthly meetup online or in person, can also be really helpful too. One word of caution, though, is to choose those folks carefully. New creative work can be really fragile, and new creators who haven't received much external feedback can get discouraged easily. It can be truly devastating to make a creative work and then share it with someone and receive unhelpful feedback. That's why it's so important to choose folks who also have some skin in the game. Not that you can never learn anything from someone who isn't making creative work. You absolutely can, but it definitely feels less vulnerable to ask another creative person who is at a similar phase to you and is asking you for feedback as well. You can also kind of test this out, maybe test a person out by critiquing a piece that neither of you has made and seeing what their feedback style is. Or you could make ground rules for the type of feedback that can be offered in the group. For example, feedback has to be specific and supported by examples in the work rather than a, just a global declaration of something feeling off. So if you're going to take this route to making your own destination for your work, if the destination is going to be presentation to your monthly creative group, just make sure that the work you're sharing is really ready to be shared and that the people you're sharing it with deserve your trust. The third self-made destination is probably one of the most common for creative people, and it's just to make your work as a gift for someone else. This can be really helpful both at the conceptual level because you're considering the person for whom you're making this gift as you're coming up with the concept, and it also does give you a very concrete and specific endpoint for that work where it's not just done, but it's out of your hands. I think another kind of added benefit from this approach is that if you're somebody who really does feel fueled by doing things for others, by doing something nice for another person, this is a great way to harness some of that energy and to get yourself making more creative work. In a previous episode, we talked about the challenge of feeling guilty or selfish when you sit down to make creative work. And this can be another way to turn the volume down on that thought where you can say to yourself, actually, I am making this work for somebody else. This is a gift. It's a self-made destination, but since it's for a specific person, there is a layer of externalization, which can be really helpful. This destination has a lot in common with the previous one, since it's sharing your work with an actual human being. So I would keep in mind some of that same awareness and consideration consideration of the people that you choose to give your gift to. For the last approach to self-made destinations, we are going to talk about making the work for an imagined client or an imagined creative brief. So this approach makes the most sense, obviously, if you're somebody who wants to do creative work at a commercial level as a professional. If you're somebody who is doing this for personal reasons, for your own fulfillment, or you're just kind of experimenting and you're not really sure where you're going to take it, then I would say one of the other destinations might make more sense. But if you're somebody who wants to do this commercially, coming up with an imagined client or an imagined end use is really helpful on multiple levels. Everything from really clarifying the content and the style of your work, what it's about, how it looks and feels, to the way the work would ultimately be presented and shared by the imagined client. 
So you can do this by looking at the kind of work you make or want to make and then thinking about what kind of creative brief would call for that work. Or you could start with the destination in mind, coming up with the brief first, and then coming up with a concept to fit within that brief. This process, this coming up with uh, an imaginary brief, pretend client work, is something I've gotten into in the past quite a bit in older YouTube videos. So definitely have a look there if you want to dig into this. I have a couple of playlists on that. Uh, But at this point, it's a common enough suggestion that there are also practice briefs and creative client prompts that you can just find online. One site that I found uh, while doing just some very quick research is called fakeclients.com where you can uh, look at different uh, briefs that they have put together there and work from one of those briefs. But you can also just Google fake fake illustration brief or something similar. Uh, Whatever you do here, creating work for a fake client for a pretend prompt touches on all of the value, all of the things that we get out of having a destination. It gives clarity of purpose, what the work is made for, clarity of audience, the work being made for someone, and clarity of completion. So an objective external marker for when the work is done, i.e. whenever the work fulfills the brief. Now, before we wrap up today, I want to have a quick chat about having a destination relates to the creative process itself. I am someone who has talked a lot about the importance of the creative process and about how putting the process first and really engaging deeply with the process can be incredibly motivating and catalyzing. So right now I do feel a little bit of a sense of internal conflict because this whole episode has been about how important it is to have a destination. So I want to really clarify what I mean by destination and how it supports a process forward approach to art making. A destination is not a style or a voice or even a strategic plan for where you're ultimately taking your creative work. We're looking at this at a very basic functional level. The destination for your creative work is just the place where it's going when it's done. It's the signal you send to yourself that it's time to move on to the next thing. And to this end, including the destination in your process doesn't mean that you need to sit down and figure out the ultimate trajectory, the ultimate place that you're going with your creative practice and what you want to do with an artist and where this is all going to end up. It just means that you're developing your body of creative work. And as a part of that process, you include clear endpoints. The way that this looked for me was putting my work on Tumblr. And part of why I chose to do it that way, why I chose that as an endpoint, was that when I started painting again close to 10 years ago now, I didn't want to get hung up on things being perfect. I didn't want to just keep adding to my drawer of partially completed projects. I wanted to have a very clear marker for myself, a very clear structure where I could objectively say, yes, this is done and this is where it's going. And that's why I view destinations as being very closely tied to the creative process itself. Having a clear marker for when the work is done allows you to even more deeply engage in the process at that level of the neutral observer, to be able to pay attention to it, to be able to pay attention to the process and have those moments where you can reflect and look back and say, yes, this is what I want to do next time. And this is what worked well in this piece, or this really needs to change. And I did not enjoy doing that. So I'm going to try to shift things around. Having the destination for your work and having that clear endpoint allows you the space to do that. So this week, if you have been feeling a little bit aimless and unstructured in your creative practice, experiment with one of these destinations. Share the work online, share it in a group, make something for someone, make something for a pretend client. As always, I would love to see it if you do end up putting any of these online. So please tag me. I'm at Kendall Hilligus. Thank you to everyone who has shared the show and rated it on Apple Podcasts so far. It really helps. Thank you for spending time with me, friends. I will see you next week. Bye. (laughs) 